Let's start with another example of iteration, this time with the Fibonacci sequence. Feel free to get familiar with this sequence because we'll look at it several times during the course. Here's Fibonacci. He was a Middle Ages Italian mathematician who really liked this sequence of numbers, which is defined as 0 and then 1. And then the next number is always the sum of the current number and its predecessor. Fibonacci did not invent the sequence, but he made it popular in Europe. He also was not really named Fibonacci, that was a nickname. But anyway, people really like this sequence. Uh, for instance, you can use it to build the Fibonacci spiral, which is constructed by drawing a spiral through the corners of a bunch of squares, each of which has the side length of a Fibonacci number. And the Fibonacci spiral is interesting mathematically, and people also like to look for that shape in nature, as in this cross-section of a red cabbage. Okay, so let's write a function that returns the nth Fibonacci number. We'll call it fib. We'll compute the nth Fibonacci number for n greater than or equal to 2. And we'll do so by binding the names predecessor and current to 0 and 1, the first two Fibonacci numbers. And then we'll track another name, k. And k will tell us which Fibonacci number in the sequence is currently bound to the name current. So current is currently bound to the second Fibonacci number, so k is 2. And then we'll iterate through the Fibonacci sequence until current is bound to the one that we actually want, and that's what we'll return. So, while k is less than n, meaning while it's the case that current is bound to a Fibonacci number other than the one we want, n, we will do the following. We will rebind the names predecessor and current. Now remember the execution rule for an assignment statement. We evaluate everything on the right side before rebinding any names to the left. So we figure out what the current Fibonacci number is, we sum together the predecessor and the current to get the next one, and then predecessor and current as names will be bound to the next two elements in the sequence. I'll show you an animation in a second. And this equation is what's actually computing the next Fibonacci number. We'll also update k, and then when we're finished with that process, we return current. So let's take a look at a snippet of the environment. When we call fib for any n, we're going to introduce a frame that looks like this, where n is bound to the argument we pass in, and predecessor and current are always going to be bound to adjacent elements of the Fibonacci sequence. So because of the first line, they'll be bound to 0 and 1 at the beginning. Then, every time we execute this assignment statement, they'll be bound to new values, which are uh, moving up the sequence. So now they're bound to the second and third. If we execute this again, they're bound to the third and fourth. Now they're bound to the fourth and fifth. Now this is an interesting example because the computation that we do to compute predecessor requires current. The computation that we do to compute the new current value requires predecessor. So the most natural way to express this is to just compute both of these values at the same time before binding them to these names.